Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. My name is Fatima Danani, and on behalf of Alumni Affairs at the Aga Khan University, I am delighted to be welcoming all of you joining us today from around the world. We are so excited to be launching this Connecting AKU webinar series, which very much is intended for our wider AKU family, especially our beloved alumni. Since we are physically distanced from each other, we hope that through this series, we can continue to engage with you and share with you AKU's magnificent work, whether that is the leading role it's playing in responding to the global pandemic, ways for us to cope, manage, and continue to lead wholesome and productive lives, or simply some content that can give us a bit of respite from the COVID conversations. To begin this series, we have with us today Dr. Aisha Mian to share her thoughts on mental health in a global pandemic. Dr. Aisha might be very familiar to many of you as she is a graduate of the Aga Khan University's College Medical College in Pakistan. Currently, she serves as the university's Dean of Students and as a faculty member in the Department of Psychiatry. She has a number of pioneering accomplishments, including leading AKU's first gender equity conference last year held at the university. Today's session will run for 60 minutes. Dr. Aisha will speak for the first 20 to 25 minutes, and then we will take questions from the audience. To ask a question, please email alumni at aku.edu. As this is our first webinar, we apologize in advance for any technical or other glitches. I now welcome Dr. Aisha. Thank you so much, Fatima. Um, wonderful being here. And now I'm gonna try to see if I can share my screen. And if somebody just let me know that they can see this, then I can go ahead. Yes, Dr. Aisha, we can see it. Okay, wonderful. So um, welcome everyone. First of all, thank you so much to AKU Alumni Affairs for um, uh, putting together this fantastic initiative um, called Connecting AKU and bringing um, the AKU community together at this very difficult time. Um, I, from what I know from um, Abdul Wahidna is that we have about, um, you know, 60 to 70% of the audience today um, is our alumni. And then we have some students. Um, we also have AKU faculty, AKU staff, we have AKU supports. And then we have about 30 to 40 um, of uh, members that are outside of AKU. So welcome everyone. We also have people from different parts of the world actually. So um, a number of people from Pakistan, but then we also have within us in our audience, people from East Africa, people from London, US, um, a couple from Saudi Arabia, Malaysia. Um, so this is absolutely wonderful. Um, I think this really brings the whole globe, the whole world together and um, really privileged and humbled to be talking to you all today. So um, I'm going to be talking for about um, 20, 25 minutes, um, just giving an overview of mental wellness during um, these unprecedented times. A lot of material that I'm going to be talking about, perhaps you know already. And then um, what I would really be interested in is for us to have some sort of a discussion, some sort of a you know, question answer session after um, I have spoken. So for your questions, while I'm talking, if you can email your questions to alumni at aku.edu, then um, you know, Fatima will be um, collecting those and I'll answer those um, when I'm done with my, um, with my talk. So um, to get started, I just want to start with a few disclosures. So I think it's important for um, all the audience to understand the context that I come from because um, you know, that always colors perspectives, that colors, um, you know, what I'm going to tell you and how I perceive uh, what is happening to us today. So first of all, I'm a psychiatrist and my subspecialization is in child adolescent psychiatry. So a lot of what I show, a lot of what I talk about, um, some of the figures and some of the cartoons that I show do come from that lens of, um, you know, working very closely with parents, with families, 
uh, with the youth um, as well as children. I also have two kids, um, an 18 year old and a 13 year old. Uh, my husband is an ER physician. I live in Pakistan. The reason I say all of these things is that, you know, um, I am in lockdown with all of these people, um, like, like a lot of you maybe with your families. And again, that colors what I am going through and, uh, you know, how I perceive what is happening um, around us. I'm also an extrovert um, and in lockdown. So you can imagine that I also feel a significant amount of anxiety and stress of, of being cooped up now for almost about a month. Um, the only times that um, I have gone out is to do my clinics, uh, where I have lots of patients who are themselves facing an overwhelming sense of anxiety. So, um, you know, I don't want to give a sense in my talk that I know it all. Um, I, as I bring out concepts, I, I want all of my audience to realize that, you know, we're all in this together, we're all going through it. And perhaps within that, I may be able to give some ideas of, you know, what we can do to help with our stress, to help with our anxiety and look towards our mental well-being. So let's face it, um, this is, these are very, very strange times. Um, this is um, a very old uh, painting from the 19th century that you all may be aware of. And um, a lot of us are feeling the sense of, it's called the scream, and a lot of us may be feeling the sense of severe anxiety, um, an overwhelming sense of stress as we go through these times. But um, as I was thinking of what figures to put out there to give a sense of, you know, where we all are, again, you know, coming from a place of uh, being a child, adolescent psychiatrist, um, this resonated with me a lot more. So um, this is from Kung Fu Panda. And pretty much I think that a lot of it, there may be some amongst us who are sage-like, who figured it out, um, all of it. Um, who um, are managing life well through this. But a lot of us are feeling like we've been put on a guard and kind of pushed down a slope and we have no idea what's going to hit us um, at the end of it. And um, some of us may be feeling like we're losing our stripes. Um, and, you know, because there is just so much stress, we might be um, doing things that are uncharacteristic of us. We might be feelings, feelings and emotions that are very uncharacteristic of who we are. And the reason, again, that I show these is to, again, put it into perspective and perhaps even normalize the idea that it's okay to feel this way. If not now, then when? Um, it's okay to feel like things are out of control. It's okay to feel like um, there are aspects of our personality that we may never have been acquainted with before, and those aspects are, um, you know, coming out or being reflected in some of the things that we we are doing um, these days. So, what's happening around the world? Um, you all know that um, we have a pandemic. So, COVID nineteen has happened. Here's a picture of COVID nineteen. It actually looks pretty. Um, it, it sort of doesn't give the sense of how deadly this virus um, has been for us. And across the globe, about 200,000 people have already died. And the unfortunate anticipation is that there may, there may be more um, that are suffering. I also want to give a sense here that um, even though we give numbers of people that are dead, this is a very, very small percentage of the whole world's population. And um, at the end of this pandemic, very few would have contracted the virus. Um, even fewer would have died from it, but each and every one of us would have been psychologically affected by it. And it's, it's, I think that should give us pause and make us think that how is it that we're gonna deal with a world where everybody has uh, been affected with something um, that is so new, something that is so mysterious, something that we were not anticipating, something that we don't, we didn't know about, and it just, it has sort of struck us out, um, out from, from the blue. We don't have a vaccine for it. We have truly been taken by surprise in the true sense of the word. We don't have enough of anything. We don't have enough tests. We don't have enough masks. We don't have enough uh, protective and, uh, equipment. We don't have enough information. Every day there is new information that's coming out um, and we're trying to make a sense of 
you know, what the forecasts will be, who's going to get affected, who's not going to get affected. We don't have enough data. We have no idea why this virus is um, striking some people more than the others. Why are people of an older age more vulnerable to it? Why are some countries more vulnerable than others? Um, there is just no um, pattern at this point that we have been able to establish. And for us, for a world that we live in, um, that is unprecedented. That, that mystery, that uncertainty, that not knowing is, um, is not what we are used to. We are very used to being in control and suddenly now we are not in control. But we, I would also like us to think a little bit about this pandemic and let's try to put this into perspective. So, um, as I said before, that about we've had about 200,000 deaths in the past three months. But if you look at global data, about 150,000 people die every day in the world, right? So that is just a little bit less than what has of the number of people that have died. This is every day. Every day we have about 150,000 people that die, not of the virus, but of other reasons. Some, most of the times it's natural causes, it's old age, it's disease. Um, so different, different reasons that people die of. So I think it's also important, um, again, from a place of public health perspective, um, and a lot of the people of the audience here are in the health-related fields, to understand that and put, put sort of think, think um, sort of by taking a step back. Pakistan, for example, has had 200 reported deaths as of now, except that, you know, every day, and this is epidemiological data from Pakistan, we have 300 people that die every day due to cardiovascular disease. We had a speaker this afternoon um, from France, a professor of public health that was talking to us in our department of psychiatry. And he said that by the end of the year, they have had 20,000 deaths in France up until now. And by the end of the year, they're anticipating about 50,000 deaths uh, because of the virus. Except that he said that there's a lot less than the number of people that die every year in France because of tobacco. Except that we are not doing much about tobacco. So, the, the reason that I say all of these things is for, for us to get a sort of a larger global perspective um, of, of the virus and what it's doing to us. And then kind of try to think that if that is the case, if in the larger perspective, you know, these are still fewer deaths, this, this is still something that actually we can in some ways control. We know we, we can do small things, we can wash our hands, we can keep a distance and we can uh, you know, manage this, why is it causing so much anxiety? And I'll tell you in a minute, why the fear? So some facts, we've had like a major, major shock to our healthcare systems. We did not anticipate that. So even if there was a sense that yes, we'd have, we've had the Spanish flu, we've had pandemics before, we've had the plague, we, fit, we had thought that we were good, we were in a good place, that if something like this were to happen again, if there was a virus, if there was SARS, Ebola, flu, we could handle it, and yet we have not been good enough. Whatever health systems existed in more developed worlds like you know, um, UK, like the US, we're really seeing things fall apart. Um, we are short of ICUs, we are short of ventilators, we are short of nursing and healthcare workers, we are asking for more doctors, people are volunteering um, to go in as physicians, physicians are being drafted, like soldiers get drafted into war. So yes, this is all new. Um, and then the other thing that's going on that has really shook us in some ways is that in a lot of developed worlds, we doctors, nurses, healthcare workers um, are having to make choices which they didn't do before. So let's say in the developing world, we might be um, more familiar with saying that, okay, you know, we're not gonna have enough ventilators. So if we have a number of patients coming in, we have to make a choice as to who gets the ventilator, who doesn't, you know, perhaps the 90 year old would not, or somebody who has a disease, which is gonna be fatal anyways. Maybe we don't give a ventilator to that person, we give it to somebody else. We are used to making those choices, but a, but a lot of people in the developed world were not um, used to making those choices and now they're having to make those choices, which again brings in a lot of fear. We do know, we've seen it, you all must have read a lot more than I have, that there is um, economies in free fall. There is a major economic crisis. 
There's also political crisis. So again, you know, politicians are having to make decisions of whether they want to put the countries in lockdown or whether they want, they're worried about economy and um, they're not going to put the country in lockdown and let the, um, you know, economy go on and people can continue to go to their jobs and, um, you know, especially the day, care, the day workers and all. So those decisions are, um, are being made. We have an education crisis. So suddenly there are no schools, there are no colleges and very quickly overnight, people who had never done anything online are having to move online. Students are having to learn a new way of um, learning. Teachers are having um, to learn a new way of teaching. So there is a crisis and those facts lead to a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear because these are truly un unprecedented times. Also, um, life as we knew it is really no more. So again, facts, um, you know, our travel has gone, um, globalization that was so kind of second nature to us that we could move between countries is gone, borders are closed, retail is, is down and out, capitalism is gone, parks, gyms, um, all of those things that we knew that gave structure to our day, that gave a certain sense of, um, you know, comfort to our day um, that, you know, we're going to go to work, then we'll go to the gym, we'll go out running, we'll take our kids to the park, um, you know, they've gone to school this morning. All of those things have suddenly disappeared. So again, facts that are leading to a lot of uncertainty, which causes anxiety and stress. And then, you know, when you have a pandemic like this, we have facts that, um, you know, cause a lot of fear, but then we also have a lot of feelings and emotions that cause a lot of fear. They may not be based on facts at all. Um, they, there may be no objectivity to those feelings or emotions, but they cause significant amount of fear. And some of those things are, for example, you know, social fear or social distancing. Um, social fear comes from, you know, kind of reading now, a lot of people are reading about the plague, a lot of people are reading about the Spanish flu, and suddenly they are wondering, is this what's going to happen? They are wondering, is there going to be a second wave? They are wondering if things will ever go back to how they were before, and those um, are things that are causing them fear. Social distancing, which was never a part of our um, gamut, which was not, which was never used as a treatment modality, um, you know, as doc, as doctors, as physicians, as health, as healthcare workers, as nurses, we are not used to telling people, "Hey, wash your hands and stay at home." We prescribe medications. We tell them how to take care of wounds. We tell them, you know, how to take care of their diabetes or their, um, you know, um, hypertension, but washing your hands and keeping six feet away and not hugging your children and being in lockdown with your family 24 seven has never been something that we've prescribed, which is also scary because it's new to all of us. Um, I mentioned before, no globalization. We're not moving across um, borders. Some of us have families that are, um, you know, very far away now when it didn't, they didn't seem so far away um, up until a month ago or two months ago. And now suddenly we are unable to bring them to us or go to them. There are significant, significant feelings of insecurity. We have no idea, even though there is no objectivity to it, there is no objectivity to the fact that if I was to go out and run um, in my lane outside, that I will catch the virus. But the fear, not knowing who has um, corona, who has COVID, who doesn't have COVID, if I come too close to that person, will I get it? Those are all feelings of insecurity that may not be based in facts at all, but make us feel very, very anxious. We've also had a change in our priorities. So things that kind of gave us comfort. So for example, um, we'll go out and eat, have a family meal outside. We'll go to a restaurant. Those have gone away. Um, I'll, I'm feeling really down. So I'll go and, you know, go do some shopping and, you know, buy some, some fun thing for myself, even if it's small. Um, that that uh, choice has gone away. We're realizing that we have to find our comfort in things that were not based in capitalism. We have to find our comfort in relationships and family time. Um, and that, that causes a lot of fear. And then, you know, we're also realizing that relationships are a lot more important than capitalism, than grades, than Ivy League schools. 
all of that, um, life in general, what is more important, my, my running is important, my music is important, my reading is important, all of those things are different than what they were yesterday. I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to specifically talk to talk about healthcare workers because they really are um, at um, significantly more risk at this time of mental health um, concerns and also just burnout. And I know that a significant uh, uh, percentage of this audience are people related to the health fields. So what are some of the challenges for healthcare workers and what is it that's causing them to be more anxious? So there are limited resources, right? We've talked about ventilators talked about tests, we've talked about masks, we um, are being asked to use PPE, which is a protective uh, equipment, but we don't all know how to use it. And um, even the places that have it, uh, you know, people are scared that are we using it the right way. There's also a significant amount, lack of organizational clarity. So who's doing what, who is in charge, things have changed, um, and that causes a significant amount of concern. Mm -hmm. There are altered standards of care. So, you know, we will not, um, you know, for it's, um, we're hearing a lot of stories from England, for example, where they don't have enough ventilators, they don't have enough ICU beds, and they're having to decide who stays home and who gets to be admitted to the hospital. And sometimes, you know, those may not be based on the ethical standards and values that you were used to, which causes a significant amount of moral injury to um, healthcare workers which leads to burnout. There's a lot of witnessing of deaths. And in a lot of cases, because these deaths are happening in isolation, physicians and nurses and healthcare workers are really the only people who are around these people as they're dying. So you're having to comfort um, somebody who's dying, who's alone, and you suddenly now are their only family. And that also then causes um, a significant amount of anxiety and just um, burden for the healthcare worker. There are challenging team dynamics. Of course, there's the fear of contracting illness. They worry about the safety of their family. And then there is stress stigma, significant amount of stigma. A lot of physicians have talked about how, you know, there are people who've said, you know, I'd rather not meet up with you or I'd rather not come close or I'd rather not, um, you know, be in close proximity to you because, you know, you work in the ER or you're a frontline worker. There's fatigue. They feel a significant lack of appreciation. And then, of course, there are all, all across the globe, um, you know, they're having to take uh, pay cuts or they're being furloughed. So they are worried also about the financial constraints. Um, again, just, just very quickly, um, you know, there was a very quick poll that was done um, in the um, US um, on about a thousand adults. This was in March and they talked about um, the anxiety that comes from becoming seriously ill or dying from COVID. They're anxious about the possibility of family and loved ones getting COVID, um, you know, impact on their mental health, um, on their day-to-day -day lives. They're concerned about negative impact on finances. We talked about this. They talked about having trouble sleeping. A number of them talked about consuming more alcohol, cigarette smoking um, to help with uh, manage their stress. They talked about fighting more with their partners and then also talked about having trouble concentrating on things. Again, a quick poll that was done. Um, this was again in March and um, a good, you know, 19 to 25% talked about um, having um, had a negative impact, how COVID has had a negative impact on their mental health. And you can see that um, the percentages are a little bit higher amongst the females, amongst the, um, you know, uh, Blacks, African Americans, Hispanics, and these are again, you know, people that already saw disparities even before that. So these are considered minorities, and you see that the impact of mental health is still significantly more on, um, you know, women and minorities. This was an interesting slide. I just wanted to share this with you of sort of the cycle of what happens. Um, in any disaster, when you're faced with a disaster, the emotional highs and the emotional lows that you feel. And you can see that pre-disaster, you know, you're kind of somewhere in the middle um, between emotionally feeling high and low. Uh, this is the time where there's a warning, there's a threat. And as the impact happens and you kind of feel that, yes, this is something serious, the first thing that happens is that you feel a lot of, you kind of feel gung-ho that I want to do something about it. You want to be heroic, you want to do things, you want to make a difference. 
and you um, get on a on and on a, on an emotional high, and that um, you know um, is sort of your honeymoon period. The community comes together. The healthcare community has really come together. And you saw that about a month ago. The stories that were coming out was about um, you know physicians um, in um, superhero garb and you know people were appreciating them and saying that you know you are our soldiers and you are our new superheroes and then slowly as um you know physicians and healthcare workers and nurses um and other front frontline workers as they're beginning to see the extent of the problem the lack of resources disillusionment is set, settling in and that's when you see the emotional lows where um you know there are trigger events where you know deaths may be happening or your co-workers may be contracting the disease and that that's when you start feeling significant amount of disillusionment and this is where physicians tend to be at and not just physicians all healthcare workers um tend to be at a significant risk for um contracting mental health um disorders or having men- or symptoms of depression anxiety and stress and then of course uh, you know once things are a little bit better um they move on to um reconstruction and a new beginning and working through some of this uh you know disaster that has happened so let's move on to what can we do i'll take just another 5 to 10 minutes um so one of the things and this may completely sound cliched um i always tell people uh, because it works that when you can do anything in life when you can be anything um that you can be be kind and it's very very important and when i say be kind i'm not just talking about being kind to the person next to you the first and foremost i talk about being kind to yourself um it's important to have self compassion i'll talk about that in a minute but be kind to oneself be kind to family be kind to coworkers leaders politicians everybody is trying some more than others but everybody is trying to do the best that we can and um if we are kind to what decisions are being taken then that helps us with our own mental health as well self compassion is extremely integral at this time and the three components of self compassion the first one is mindfulness mindfulness really means that you are living in the moment and you are in touch with whatever you're feeling at that point so if you're feeling fear if you're feeling anxiety if you're feeling anger if you're feeling bliss if you're feeling happy being with family um or if you're happy because you know you were scared that you might have tested positive but your test comes out negative understanding and being in touch with your feeling with your emotion at that time is mindfulness so knowing what you are feeling at that point and then at that time whatever you might be feeling not judging yourself again goes back to being kind that it's okay for me to feel fear it's okay for me, for me to feel angry because my institution or um you know my leadership or my country is not doing enough that i think they can do or they're not providing us with equipment or they're telling us to go out there and work and yet they're not unable to do this so um at that time allowing yourself to feel the anxiety to feel the anger and then the third piece is common humanity i think that's we've talked about that the just overall re understanding that you know um we are connected with each other and whatever i do is is important for the next person because and truly this time we know that each and every one of us like if i don't wash hands if i don't keep a physical distance if i don't take care of my um own aspects of what i need to do then i'm putting others at risk and the other thing that helps is changing anxiety into action so if you have very very if you're feeling the significant amount of anxiety then turning it into small acts of action whether it's reading a book to your child or uh, you know calling up a close friend that you haven't spoken to in a long time and just talking to them or helping out an old couple that is in lockdown and bringing them groceries um those are all small tiny actions that you can do that help um channelize that anxiety that you might be feeling at that time um this is something that you probably reading there's a deluge of um information out there talking about what is it that you can do um at home in lockdown for yourself but it's very very important to take out um time to do something 
Now, there's also a significant amount of pressure that's coming out um, from social media about, you know, everybody needs to learn to do new things. Well, no, not everybody needs to learn to do new things. This is a very, very difficult time. This is a very emotionally exhausting time. And if some people just want to chill, just want to sleep it out, just want to watch Netflix and not worry too much about, you know, learning how to cook or sing or a new instrument or learn a new language, um, it's perfectly okay to do that. So whatever works for you, um, that's what you should try to do at this time. And then realizing that even with all of this, you may still continue to get bouts of anxiety again and again. It's normal. And again, as I say that when that happens, just be kind to yourself and accept the fact that, yes, this is, this is a hard time. Um, some of you, in fact, all of you may, be, may find yourself in leadership positions, that you have people that you are taking care of. You know, sometimes it might be just your family that you're having to take care of. And it's important to know that when people are, are when they're stressed and upset, they just want to know that you care before they care what you know. Okay. What I mean by that is that, you know, before kind of going into this whole spiel of, you know, this is important, you need to do this, you need to do this, just kind of listening and showing that you care, that is the most important thing for that person right there at that time. And whoever you might be leading, please try to do that for that person. Also having a very clear vision. So if you are leading a small team, if you are, whether it's, and it might be just your, you know, in larger family, it might be, um, you know, a small department that you're leading or your little, you know, shop where you have your employees and you might be just leading those. But it's important to have a clear vision. It's important to engage with your team. Frequent communication is very, very important. Keep sending key messages. Those should be short and simple. And when you're sending your key messages, because you may need to send negative messages, make sure that the ratio of positive to negative messages is three is to one. Saying I don't know when you truly don't know is absolutely okay. What is not okay is that you say I don't know and then don't do anything about it, right? So saying I don't know and then saying, but I will try to find out for all of us is um, you know, what leaders do best. And then, you know, whatever your actions are, rooting them in compassion and rooting them in optimism um, really helps with the, um, you know, community that you're leading or the family that you're leading. So I'm going to end, um, but I think it's very, very important as we end this to think about that this will end. The pandemic will go away. Um, there will be um, a life after COVID, but are we prepared for the day after COVID? Are there lessons that we have learned? Are there things that we are going to hold true to ourselves and continue to do? And I'm going to end with um, Albert Camus' uh, quote from his book, The Plague, where he says that there's no question of heroism in all of this. It's a matter of common decency. That's an idea which may make some people smile, but the only means of fighting a plague is common decency. So as long as we're all able to do that, I think we'll all be all right and come out at the other end um, looking all right and looking good. So thank you and um, I will now take questions. All right, so I have a question here. Um, someone's asking that their concern is that they have, what they have witnessed is stigma towards the family who have had a suspect discharge from quarantine. How do we come to their aid for their psychological comfort? So I think again, um, it's important to root whatever decisions and whatever actions that you take in, um, in information. So there is very clear information out there that somebody who has actually been tested negative or um, has had tested positive but has gone through the quarantine and is now okay and has come out of it, that they are not infectious. Um, in fact, you know, they may have once, I, I, I don't want to get into the whole science of that, 
but they may have developed immunity and now they might be our actual friend because they may be able to um, you know, spread um, what, we call, what we call herd immunity. So um, again, rooting your answer in logic, in, um, in information that is correct, and just um, helping people understand that you know, once somebody has tested negative, has gone through um, you know, the treatment and all, that they are safe um, to be around everyone else. All right, another question is that, do we need a strict lockdown? Yes, no, especially in Pakistan. This is from Sadia. So Sadia, this is, um, you're asking me um, a question that um, I think is, has been, um, you know, a lot of people are thinking about it and has, um, you know, there's a lot of conflicting um, arguments out there. Um, the science community, the physicians, the nurses, the healthcare folks are um, pretty much saying, yes, we absolutely need a lockdown. We are not yet ready. We don't know the, um, you know, what, where this is going to go, uh, what uh, trajectory we are at, whether we have reached our peak, is this um, curve going to flatten or not? We've also not done enough, done enough tests. So there's a lot of data out there that is showing that for um, anybody to go get out of lockdown, we need to do significantly more tests than we are uh, being able to do right now. So um, the answer to that would be that from our perspective, from the um, you know, folks uh, that work in science and are worried about this, that um, the lockdown um, needs to continue in Pakistan. All right, the next question is that, um, I just wanna ask one question that as we all know that this unpleasant pandemic that was never in our mind, it has, been, had, it has brought unpredictable change in our lives that we were not prepared for like financially or in any other way. Um, so how do we keep ourselves and our peace of mind? Um, again, as I said, you know, this is, this is um, an uncertain time and definitely this is not something that we know a lot about. This is new to us. We still have questions. We don't know the trajectory. So this is um, very concerning. But um, having said that, there's also um, very clear things here that we can do to help ourselves, help our family, help our community. Um, you know, there is enough evidence out there that if you wear your masks when you're going out, if you don't go out unless you absolutely need to, if you are um, washing your hands well, and if you are maintaining a six feet um, distance, that you'll be okay, right? So it's, it's simple, it's clear. Um, and that in itself should be helpful for us to help with some of the um, anxiety that we're that we're facing, that there are actually concrete things that we can do to um, help us um, not get that anxious from this. All right, another question. I'm too anxious when I enter the house from work after using public transport. How do I handle my anxiety? I just imagine I'm infecting my family. Um, Absolutely, I hear you. Um, it's hard, it's hard not feeling that anxiety. Um, again, you know, one of my disclosures um, in the beginning was that my husband works in the emergency room. So when he comes back, um, you know, especially in the earlier days when, you know, we had not quite decided a pattern, he used to be very anxious about, um, you know, um, infecting um, all of us. So, but, but again, uh, as I said before, as if you're taking the right precautions, so as if, even if you're using public transport, if you have your mask on, you're making sure that you're not touching things. If you have touched things, as soon as you come home, washing your hands, wearing a mask when you're outside, even if you're using public transport, are you being able to keep um, you know, some distance from the people around you. If you're able to do all of those things, then it should not, um, you should not be um, sort of that vulnerable to infecting um, or, you know, make your uh, families uh, vulnerable to getting infected by you. So I think it's, it's just a matter of, you know, being able to um, understand and logically 
what is it that we can do and what we can't do. Now, if you do have um, people in your household that you that we know may be especially vulnerable, like you know older family members or family members that are ill um, that are facing some chronic medical condition, that then it's best that you avoid um, you know too much closeness with them or avoid meeting with them too closely, try to just talk to them over the phone or keep a safe distance from them. Okay, question five. So what are the concrete things that we can do to give ourselves peace of mind and support myself and my family and my friends? So some concrete things, as I said, one, I think we've already, and I keep reiterating that, using those safety measures. Other things that you can do, um, you know, this is this is a good time for us to connect with things that we didn't do before. So are there things that you never got time for before? Are there, you know, did you like listening to music or uh, did you like reading or do you want to connect with some old friends or some family members that you haven't been able to talk to in a long time? You can still sit down and have family time together. You can play board games with them. Um, you can watch TV with them. Um, you know, children are being homeschooled. Um, I don't know how old your children are, but you know, uh, are you able to just sit with them, kind of hear from them what they're doing in school? Is there online teaching going on that you can be a uh, part, part of? So those are, can you cook together? So those are some things that, um, you know, you can do that can help you relax also. You know, if you have YouTube available, then a lot of families that I know are now beginning to, um, you know, do mindfulness or meditation or yoga or Pilates or aerobics together just through watching YouTube videos. So are you able to do that with family? So those are just some very, very concrete things that you can do to support yourself. And then, of course, within all that, you are in 24-7 lockdown with your family. And that can be hard. So within that 24-7 I think it's important for each family member to perhaps take out time for themselves where it's just them doing something that they like, perhaps connecting with some friends that are outside of family, perhaps just reading a book. So that kind of, um, and that goes to self-compassion. That kind of alone time is also important at that, um, for that. How can we really develop our empathy, compassion, and listening skills so that we can really be there for each other? Well, this is the best time, isn't it, to try um, for all of us to try to do that. Um, so it's, it's just a matter of doing it. It's just a matter of putting your phone away, putting your laptop away, putting your iPad away, and sitting down with somebody who's next to you, whether it's your child, whether it's your spouse, your parent, um, you know, your friend um, or connecting with your friend over, you know, WhatsApp, video, FaceTime, whatever, and then just listening and just hearing from them what, um, what is it that they're going through and, um, you know, what fears they may have. Because one of the things that we talk about a lot um, in helping with some anxiety um, and depression is just being there for um, other people and listening, just listening to them and also for you to talk to people about what you are going through because that also tends to be extremely helpful. So, um, you know, finding that time, just I think that one of the things that I actually didn't talk about that is extremely, extremely anxiety provoking is social media. Um, you know, I just did clinic today and out of, you know, six patients that I saw, four of them were talked about feeling incredible amount of anxiety because they said that we can't put the phone down, we can't switch off the TV, and all we hear is about the horrific things that are happening around um, COVID-19. And that that is hard. That is very, very hard. And not just um, information around COVID-19 for your adolescents, for youth, for adults. Um, you know, going on Instagram, going on Facebook and and seeing that, you know, somebody has just learned to, um, you know, um, a new skill or somebody is cooking something fancy every day or something. Somebody is, uh, you know, learning how to dance or somebody has, um, you know, their kids have done this. I mean, that in itself, that just that exodus of information of what's happening in other people's lives and what's happening in the world can be very anxiety provoking. So as much as possible, I know it's hard, I struggle with it too, but as much as possible, you know, picking your um, phone up or looking at news um, as, as less as possible, perhaps, you know, two to three times a day, and then just put it away because that causes a significant amount of anxiety. 
So much is too much. How much news and media inputs do you think we should consume during this period in order to protect our mental health? I just answered this question. There is this whole new um, kind of concern that has come out of um, this pandemic, which is called infodemic, right? Which is just a deluge outpouring of information, right, wrong, who knows? It's, but it's just pouring from all angles and it's making us question what is it that we are doing? There's all sorts of conspiracy theories that are, you know, flying around. There's 5G, there is BCG, there is this, there's that. I mean, also there's biological warfare. So there's just significant amount of information out there that may or may not be helpful for us to know. So, um, you know, if at all possible, I say once or twice a day, but if you really are a news junkie, then try, try cutting it down to maybe three times a day. But, but, but really down, downgrade that. I think it's very, very important to not be on TV, on screen. It's also not good for children, whoever has children at home. Um, I tell uh, parents all the time that, you know, your anxiety is being transmitted to children. Um, and if, if you are watching TV all the time and you are kind of in this constant state of stress and anxiety, they're going to feel that. And, um, you know, at the other end of the pandemic, um, you know, that's going to frame how they look at life because these are the formative years of their lives. So it's important to be able to contain that for your children. Post-traumatic um, stress disorder can be a very real thing. And a lot of it is really caused now these days by what they're watching on TV and what they're hearing from their families around them. How can we, well, this is somebody who's thanking me for a superb um, talk, so you're very, very welcome. Um, and then they asked that how can we help someone who already has a tendency to mental health issues, depressive thoughts, but not clinical, especially if they cannot go out, recommended due to their age and underlying condition. Um, excellent, excellent question. I actually did not um, touch upon that. People who, are, um, who have already been suffering from psychiatric disorders um, tend to be at much higher risk during this time. So um, again, as I said before, my patients are, um, that, are, that already had anxiety or already had depressive disorders um, are feeling significantly more um, sort of a, a rise in severity of their symptoms at this point. And, um, and it's important, first of all, if there is at all a possibility of reaching out to their um, psychologists, their therapists, their psychiatrists online, lots of places now are having teleclinics please do do that. It's important to get professional help, even if they're unable to get out. Um, you know, there are lots of helplines these days, even in Pakistan. Um, there are places that are doing free teleclinics. I know Mayo um, Hospital in Lahore is doing free teleclinics. I know Sehat Kahani is doing free teleclinics. Um, you know, we are doing teleclinics. So even if you are not able to go out in person, reaching out through those hotlines, through those helplines, and trying to reach out to a professional is very important um, at this point. Do you think, okay, I am fortunately stuck on an island, which during the day isn't under a lockdown. I do Instagram stories on my page of the beach, sunset, pools to enhance the morale of those who cannot witness these in person during this time. Do you think this is a good idea or will it further affect those in lockdown negatively? No, it's wonderful. Please, please share positive messages. Please share lovely pictures. Um, you know, when I'm on Twitter, um, I, you know, it's, it's, all there are pictures about you know new new kids being born. There are um, there are pictures of you know adolescents and you know people's people's kids that are um, graduating virtually. There are pictures of people uh, with their pets. Um, you know of of uh, dawn of sunsets, and those tend to get the most likes because right now wherever we can reach to any sense of positivity of what um, of the of the good worldview and, and sort of, you know, holding on to what the world really is. I mean, there is at the other end of the pandemic, as I said, this will end. And we do have a beautiful world, um, you know, that will open up again to all of us. And hopefully we'll take care of it a lot more this time than we've done in the past. Uh, but there is, um, so again, yes, uh, that, is, that is really good for people's morale. So please do do that. And if it's really meant to share in a good way, then that's fantastic. If, you know, there are some people who may be doing it to rub it in, 
I'm sure that that's not where it's coming from. But um, if if this is really to boost up people's morale, then absolutely, I think that that is um, do share away. Okay, there's a question of how are trainees and other healthcare work workforce being supported in Pakistan and what is being done specifically to help and support them during this time? Do we have support groups to advise and assist or any other networks? Um, I do know in smaller pockets that there are people who are doing things to support healthcare workers. Um, my sense is right now that in Pakistan, at least um, we, are as um, as a healthcare community at on that honeymoon period where we are kind of like all gung ho about um, you know being a community and healthcare community and working together and um, you know the fatigue and the burnout is just now beginning to show. Um, I know that um, AKU Sonam has put in an initiative for physician well being where they're looking at their rates, the, just the prevalence of um, you know, anxiety, stress, depression amongst um, the um, healthcare force at AKU, but also trying to put in some, um, some in, interventions and initiatives for them. I also know that there is a, um, a kind of a helpline that has been put together at AKU from the Department of Psychiatry, Department of Family Medicine for all employees. Um, so I do know in the smaller cohort of um, AKU that it's been happening. I know that in some parts of other, um, you know, hospitals that they are doing some things, but at a larger level, at a provincial level, at a national level, no. And, you know, one of the things that we are beginning to talk about as a group is that there needs to be some sort of a um, provincial and national plan um, in every country, a lot of countries now have it, you know, mental health is really now on everyone's mind. And right now we are dealing with the emergencies um, around the actual infection. So right now we're struggling with PPEs, right now we're struggling with enough ventilators, with enough testing and, you know, patients being um, in the ICUs. But as soon as this ends, even right now though, um, there is going to be um, an outpouring um, a flooding with mental health issues. And um, I don't know about other countries. I think other countries have done better than us, but in Pakistan, um, in some of the other developing countries, we're really not prepared um, for the, uh, you know, the mental health, the outpouring, the floodgates that are going to open. And I think that it, um, it is imperative that we start thinking about this as soon as possible and put in some short and intermediate plans for it. Many people are in lockdown with others who are not used to being at home with their spouse all day or with their children and they're creating a stressful or abusive environment. What do you advise? I advise again, please be kind. I advise again that violence is um, not okay. Um, I, you know, I tell everyone I've been saying this um, and you know, again, very, very um, valid question we um, in Pakistan at least are not doing surveys. We don't know numbers, but in other countries like France has seen a 30% increase in domestic violence. Um, in, in UK, a particular charity uh, that works with abuse has seen a 700% increase in um, phone calls to them. So we know it's out there and one can anticipate that it's also happening in other developing countries in East Africa and Pakistan and other countries. So um, again, I, I tell people that, you know, yes, this is a hard time. And, you know, people who are, it's not just about people not being used to being at home with their spouse and children. It's also that they are at home and they are facing significant uncertainty themselves. They are scared themselves. They may have lost their jobs. They may be worried about finances. They may be worried about, you know, what's going to happen at the other end of it. They may be worried about con their family contracting a disease and fear if it's not an anxiety, if it's not um, talked about and not communicated to other people, um, especially in our cultures, tends to come out in anger and with violence. So um, it's important. It's very, very important for everybody to um, understand that it's, this is the time where we need to work with compassion. We need to work with kindness. We need to work with understanding that everybody 
is in um, in a difficult period. A lot of women actually are having a very, very hard time with this because, especially working women, because some of them are still working from home. They're having to take calls. They're having to, um, you know, take conference calls. Teachers are having to do online classes and they're now also homeschooling their own children and they are, you know, doing whatever housework that needs to be done. So, um, you know, again, a lot is being written about, you know, how a woman's work has actually exponentially increased um, since since this lockdown has happened. Um, and again, men who are being used to, who are used to kind of going out and doing things are now not being able to do that. So it's easy for that fear and anxiety to come out on vulnerable people at home. Um, so that's for them, for the men and, and women who might be getting upset at their kids and, um, you know, maybe abusive towards the kids but um i think also for them i think it, they need to understand that they need to say no to violence any kind of violence they need to stand up and say this is this is not acceptable all right how can we treat a psychological person who is isolated because they feel lonely and become short tempered i'm assuming you're talking about somebody who may already have a psychiatric illness um, so yes, loneliness, isolation, I think that those are very, very valid, um, things that are valid feelings, valid emotions that are, that people are going through at this time. And I think it's, it's so, um, important to, um, figure out, I, I, I made my own disclosure, right. That I, I kind of like having people over. I like going over to people. I like being with family and friends and, it's hard. I mean, I'm not isolated. I've got family. I get out, but it's still hard um, to be in lockdown like this. So, um, you know, finding out ways we have technology, which, you know, perhaps people didn't have um, in the previous plagues and, uh, you know, other times when um, pandemics occurred. So how is it that we can help them connect with their family, with their loved ones, with their friends? Can we reach out to them once or twice a day to kind of just check on them and see if they're doing okay? Um, so using technology at this time and helping them use technology, if it's something that they've not done before, helping them, teaching them of how we can stay connected, I think that that's the way to go. Okay, what differences do you anticipate as a mental health expert between the anxiety in working women compared to homemakers who are more used to being home. Um, it's new for everyone. I think that even the ones that are homemakers um, are now have children at home and um, they are also having to transition into now looking after their children's homeschooling, their children's sort of, you know, teaching, learning um, and figuring out. And then they may have other family members who, even though they were at home, um, you know, now there are other family members who are homes, then how do we reckon with that? And how do we find a new normal and an, a new sort of baseline? So um, for either one, I think it's hard. Um, for women who, who used to work outside, I think the workload has sort of almost doubled. Um, and also, you know, small, tiny things. So um, in our household, for example, it's funny because, um, you know, at one time you may have four people who need to be online. Who need to be on conference calls and so all four of us are trying to find quiet spaces and spaces where we can get good wi-fi to take these calls where the other person is not overhearing uh one so two kids who are, who are doing online schooling you know i have uh, my calls my husband may have calls so those are just um interesting realities that we are having to kind of reckon with in these um in these new times and you know, if we, if we allow them to um, get to us, if we allow them to cause us more stress, I think that's what's going to happen. If we, um, you know, kind of laugh at them, we kind of use humor um, to take care of some of these anxieties that come up, I think then that, that sort of, you know, takes a new turn. So I always tell people that humor is the best defense uh, mechanism. So trying to trying to kind of make light of what's going on. You'll still have anxiety, you'll still have sort of mood um, outbursts, but as much as possible using humor, it's very helpful. 
All right. So um, I am being told that we are out of time. So this is the last question that I will be taking. How can you avoid burnout due to WFH um, working from home? All right. Great. Sorry. I'm not good with acronyms. So uh, due to working from home when you can't step outside of the house to change your environment. Okay. You know, working from home is, is just a new concept altogether. I just posted an article on, um, on my social media about how doing teleclinics is actually so much more exhausting than seeing patients in person. Um, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you all, but I don't know what's happening, um, how you all are perceiving what I'm saying. And I'm very used to um, kind of seeing people's perception, seeing their body language to kind of change mine as well. And it's hard. It's exhausting. Similarly, doing Zoom calls all day can be exhausting. Um, and that does cause burnout. The other thing that's been happening in terms of working from home is that there's no punching in, punching out. So you pretty much could be working all day in yeah. some ways. Um, so you don't get that kind of a break. So it's hard. And I think that what, I, what I've been telling people or advising people is that make sure that you have that kind of time. Make sure that you say, that, you know, most days, um, you know, I'm going to stop at 6 p.m. and I'm not going to, um, you know, continue working after that. Take breaks, go, go out, do some other things, you know, go for a run or just go stand outside in your terrace and, you know, listen to some music. So taking breaks is important. And again, that self-compassion, being kind to yourself and figuring out what does it mean to be kind to yourself? What does yourself like? Um, so that becomes important. So we are out of time. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, really happy that um, you know you could be here with us, um, and um, you know we are going to continue that. We're going to bring the alumni affairs is going to bring in other speakers, and we'd love to stay, stay connected with you all. So appreciate your time and have a lovely day and stay safe, everyone.